Okay, so uh, uh, hello everyone, magandang gabi sa lahat. And, uh, thank, uh, welcome to episode 12 of the BitPinas webcast. And uh, thank you so much for uh, staying with us at this hour. So for those of you who don't know, um, we are BitPinas. We are a crypto publication. Uh, we talk about blockchain, NFT, crypto uh, here in the Philippines. And every Thursday, we have this thing called a BitPinas webcast, wherein basically we talk we talk and we interview the newsmakers in crypto and NFT community here in the Philippines and internationally, just like our guest for today. So uh, if you want to know more about, for example, Axe Infinity in the local Philippine setting, uh, you just go to www.pitpinas.com, our web or our, our website or our Facebook page and also on Twitter. So um, before we move, I would love I would like to um, bring up on stage my my co-host, Chin. Chin, magandang hey, gabi. And, um, Good evening, guys. Good evening to our audience. Yeah. And thank you so much again for uh, for co-hosting this uh, with me. So, um, yeah, just a quick reminder for everyone who are, who is in this webcast. Uh, just like in uh, in our previous um, episodes, yeah. please be respectful. Um, in our comments, we will not tolerate any rude comments. Um, in the comment section, and um, all, this is same with our. We are live on Facebook and Twitter. So. Yeah, so uh, for tonight's topic, so as you know, uh, Axie Infinity burst into the scene last year and with 2.1 million weekly uh, users, if I remember, um, it is now the flagship game in the NFT gaming scene, right? So yeah. basically everyone, you know, followed or took a page in what Sky Mavis is doing. And this year, the focus, um, it seems, for Sky Mavis is to have a more uh, structured uh, esports program and making sure that their co- the content creators um get rewarded for uh, their effort um within the Axie community. This is I don't know in time for the release of Axie Infinity Origin, which yeah. promises to make the game you know more competitive uh for for the for its future uh, iteration. So so for today's episode we have Zayori. Zayori is the head of esports and content creators in accent in, in sky maybe so there has a long career in in the esports industry so he has commentated and uh, organized many um tournaments uh in these um esports games like dota 2 and starcraft 2 and so and bringing his experience to the to the sky maybe and to axie infinity so we also have questions uh and pieces uh first time in our show uh so yeah. Basically, we will uh, we will give some questions. Uh, I, I think one or two questions, and all you have to do is answer them correctly. The first that can answer will you know will receive the price of one thousand SLP, and then we will also have a raffle. So, Jean. Yeah. So, um. So you have the quizzes with uh, one thousand SLP as the price, and then the night's raffle is actually sponsored by Sedano of Field Guild Games. It's a play to earn gaming guild. Um. The price is um, YGG merch package. So there you can see like there's a cap, there's a jacket, there's a, like a laptop and mouse pad. So this raffle will be done towards the end of the webcast. So um, stay tuned and um, stay with us until the end so you have the chance to win this one. Okay. All right. For the spotlight tonight, so... Mike mentioned our guest is Andrew Campbell, popularly known as Yori. Um, let's bring him up for the webcast tonight. Good evening. Hey, hey, hey. How's morning. it going? Hey, Yori. GM. 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 Yeah, it's <laughs> nice and early here. 7 a.m. Uh, in Denver. But happy to be here and excited to chat with you all again. Yeah, it's nighttime here in the Philippines. But we're so glad to have you in this webcast. Um, previously, we had Jiho in... Um, I think last year towards the end of the year, and now we're having you as the program lead for Axie Infinity and Sky Mavis about the content creators and esports side. So we're excited to get to know you and what you have in store for the community here, especially in the Philippines. Okay. Definitely. So, uh, Mike, next one. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So, Ziori, before we start off, uh, I wanted to ask where did the nickname Ziori came from? 
yeah not a really cool story on this one like most oh. gamers um i i stuck with it i i picked it up young and then it just kind of stuck over the years and then once i started getting into esports stuff i had another brand called hyper crew tv that was the one where i ran all my starcraft tournaments in like 2010 2011 uh that that project ended up going under for a variety of reasons then after that was done i figured well what better than to just take my namesake and turn that into a brand that seems pretty safe so then zyori.tv became a thing back then tv mm. was the really cool thing all of the up-and-coming broadcasters yeah. thought dot tv was going to be this really well-rounded future and of course uh, everyone kind of just went into their individual games and used tags that way so um i've been kind of stuck ever since i don't really mind it's a pretty unique word um yeah it is you know z and y that was sort of what was part of the appeal for me i thought z's were cool last letter in the alphabet and what's better than z by that logic well why so if you've got a word with a Z and a Y to open it up, I mean, in my mind, I was, uh, you know, I was cool as hell. <laughs> yeah, I really wanted to know the story behind that. So um, before we start, you mentioned the, like the history of your name. Now you have over like 10 years of experience in esports. Can you share to our audience like how that came to be and um, how did you get into NFTs and blockchain? Yeah, so I got into esports when I was still studying in undergrad. I have a bachelor's degree in entrepreneurship, which is basically just a, a small business degree with a, a couple of creative artsy classes mixed in there. And about halfway through when I was a junior, I started playing StarCraft II just for fun. And then somebody linked me to a StarCraft tournament. I found TeamLiquid.net. And then that opened my eyes to this whole subculture of people that are creating tournaments, broadcasting streams pushing that content out live and engaging with viewers in this. I mean, we didn't have Twitch chat back then, but it was kind of like just in TV chat, you know, this live chat room yeah. experience. So this was just a really interesting time, you know, over 10 years ago when live streaming from your house with just a regular gaming computer that you had became possible. And that's what started this whole esports advent. And it matched up very nicely with my timeline in terms of looking for something to do with my life, finding a career path and falling deep into something that had at least a couple of jobs by the time I graduated. Uh, so I worked mostly in the Dota 2 space. Uh, I was CEO of or managing director of Moonduck Studios and agency for about six years before I joined Axie. Uh, we focused on running Dota 2 tournaments. I did some play-by-play -play commentary, desk hosting, but a lot of project management and uh, the, the boring work that helps hold it all together. You know, the actual tournaments are the fun part. It's all the paperwork and financial stuff that's a lot less fun. Um, I actually got into blockchain a really long time ago, but I'm one of these kind of conservative investors that spent years just watching the market before I put any money in. Uh, in yeah. 2018, I tried to make my own blockchain game. I actually just shared a tweet yeah. yesterday um, that highlighted my first interaction with PsychOut, which went all the way back to June 2018 when he had reached out to me about playing in the alpha of one of the little games that I was trying to make. Uh, my games didn't go anywhere. And then I discovered Axie. It was like, wow, these guys are already a step ahead. They've already knocked it out of the park. How could I ever compete with this IP? So I became a lurker. I went back to doing Dilda stuff. And then in 2021, I was ready for a career change right around the time they announced Scott Mavis. So at that point, it just seemed like a really natural fit. I had a long history in esports and all of these other things. And then I had also done some stuff in blockchain. So they knew that I was at least um, like thinking about game economies and how Web3 could be connected into the gaming experience, even if my game never got off the ground. There weren't a ton of people even thinking about trying to make blockchain games in 2018. So uh, yeah. kind of funny to think that back then, all of my Dota colleagues made fun of me for, for having a failed project. But in reality, that was setting me up for, the, for my future to meet Psych Out and be on that radar and then ultimately yeah. like get an outreach when, when they were ready for me. Right. That makes sense. And what was it about like Axie and NFT games that made you jump from like a long esports focused um, career with like games such as Dota 2 to like something new like Axie? Yeah, they caught me at a time when I felt like my career was ready for a change. Mm. I think centralized gaming has been struggling um, for the last five years or so. Um, at first, I thought it might have just been individual game developers or it might have just been the space that I was in. Um, Dota 2 is a uniquely strange one where back in 2013, we had some really robust crowdfunding tools that allowed third parties like me to run tournaments and monetize them and sell digital goods within the Dota client. And that stuff slowly got trimmed down and taken away uh, over time. And when you look at a snapshot of like 2021, 
wow, um, very hard to run a tournament in comparison to like what I was doing with Beyond the Summit back in 2014 when we were able to utilize um, crowdfunding directly through the game client. So it's felt like things have been getting almost like worse for consumers over time instead of better. And I feel like it should be the opposite. And then you start to see some of the business models of these other games out there that are, are kind of antiquated. It's like a, a very high extraction model for the developer. And it feels like their business model is not about how do we provide value for gamers, but how do we yeah. extract value from gamers? And that's like amazing from a purely capitalistic, oh my gosh, look at our billions of dollars in profits kind of lens. But it starts to feel a little soulless for a while. Um, and as a live commentator, I, I was really starting to, to realize like the gravity of my voice and that anytime I was doing sponsor plugs, like I, I'm, I'm literally telling someone to buy something and I should always feel good about what it is that I'm plugging. And in the ideal world, I should never be shilling like a betting company or something else that I, I might disagree with just because it's a paycheck. And eventually my Dota career got to the point where there wasn't really a choice there. It was, do you want to make money as a commentator? Well, then do the plugs, son. If you don't want to do the plugs, find another freaking job. Uh, and that's like really hard, you know, like making that decision in real time as you know, there's somebody right there to take your job as a caster if, if you're willing to pass on it. So these are all just different factors for me that led me to feel like I need a change. I can't, I can't do this Dota caster grind anymore. It doesn't fuel me the same way that it used to. Um, I wasn't really looking for blockchain, but when Alex reached out to me and mentioned all the things that they've been working on, mentioned their investment round that was coming up, it was really impressive to me that the Axie co-founders kept building this entire time. In 2018, yeah. I lost faith. Like I lost track of... of crypto and blockchain and the ethos in 2019 during the bear market i was one of those people that was like i don't know about ethereum i, I maybe i had it wrong I, I was really bullish and then i got into this point of what's it all for man what what's the point of all the icos is this platform actually a net benefit to the ecosystem and then i got distracted by running events and going back to the centralized world but mm -hmm. um i i think i could i could feel that shake up and um yeah the timing was just right and when, when he came back and said we're starting a company, we're hiring all these people and you know, we're going to raise millions of dollars. Uh, I think we're on the cusp of something really big. I, I just I did a deep dive and I, I agreed with him. And then I met the rest of the co-founders and went, wow, I think I really like these guys. These guys are builders first. They're really focused on designing this from the ground up and building something scalable for the first time that no one has ever done before. That sounds really challenging, but really exciting. And if we can get it right, the rewards will be huge. So um, yeah. to me, that was a really exciting value proposition. And at the end of the day, I needed something different. So it was it was going to be something. And uh, I'm really glad that the you know the stars kind of aligned. Right. Right. So what, I was. Oh, go ahead, Mike. Yeah, yeah. I was just really curious. No, so when you when you first uh, announced that you are going into um you're going to to Sky maybe Stocks Infinity that was around June or June last year. I, would, mm -hmm. I, I just wonder, like, how did the Dota 2 community react that when you left for Sky Mavis? And, um, yeah, as part of Axie, did you quickly settle into the role or did you find it a bit different from the community you were part, yeah. part of before? Yeah, so I joined Axie at, like, <laughs> kind of the ideal time. It couldn't have been more serendipitous. Uh, when I announced, I had already been doing some work with Axie for... Mm -hmm at least a month or about a month and a half. I had been casting the second season of the Dota DPC opener. So I had that locked in like months in advance. So I was kind of moonlighting Axie while I was casting a full-time schedule. Um, that first month was pretty intense. So there a lot of learning that was going on. Um, the community was really welcoming to me. So I, it, it's easier too when everything is growing and everyone's making money and everything's booming. So um, there wasn't a lot of negativity going around in general at that time. But people were really excited to see fresh blood. I was worried that people would see me as an outsider or someone that was less than because I didn't have blockchain credentials. And it was actually the opposite. Uh, there were a lot of people that reached out to me and said, hey, we've got no shortage of folks that know blockchain and have made a, a whole boatload of money flipping tokens. What we don't have are people with real world skills, with people that understand esports. And like it's a big sign for Web3 in general, when people like you want to leave the Web2 world behind and come over and join us here with the Web3 builders. So people were just genuinely very excited. Uh, and I was also very excited for a new beginning. Uh, it kind of felt like this was the intersection of uh, all, all my different interests and different skills. So 
um, yeah, it was just kind of a perfect fit. I think there was a first question there that I, I spaced on and didn't really answer. What was the first part? Yeah, so how did the Dota 2 community ah, react? Yeah, the Dota 2 community. Sorry, so I, kind of as expected, I, I think we all know that there's a huge gap between Web 2 centralized gamers and what we're building here in Web 3. I think the Web 3 NFT gaming stuff is really early, so it's it's hard to see the full package You know, when we're still in alpha and only 20 or 25 percent of our universe is deployed. So I, I understand some of the psychology there, even though people I've really been enjoying uh, spreading misinformation about why NFT gaming is not good. Of course, one of the big ones is the environmental concerns with people not realizing that Ronin is a proof of authority, proof of stake network, and doesn't have proof of work or burn, you know, excess amounts of, of electricity for security. So um, these sorts of things I'm no stranger to, and I know it takes a lot of one-on-one -on -one difficult conversations to really break through to people when they've been brainwashed that NFTs and at large are just all one big giant scam. That's like a really big nut to crack. So I definitely was bracing for impact. Um, Dota is a really intense environment where people are very opinionated. You have a lot of lovers, you have a lot of haters, and there's certainly people in the middle. So uh, it was no surprise to see the Reddit thread full of negative comments and people wishing me ill. There were a ton of people that posted comments originally wishing me well and then realizing that Axie was an NFT game and not just some other mobile game. And then they would edit their comment and be like, somebody contact him. Maybe he doesn't know that it's a scam. You know, there were a lot of really comical comments talking about how Axie was going to die in six months once we ran out of runway, how it was a giant rug and the VCs were going to get their money back, but I was going to be left holding the bag. Um, all sorts of other people, you know, wishing wishing ill in my direction it, it's just kind of how it goes i i think it's like low-hanging fruit it feels like an easy target people really love these social media gotchas and um they're like hey this guy's bad because he's doing a scam is like it, that's a really sexy headline even if there's no truth to it at all so yeah i i can't say i wasn't expecting it but it was definitely uh the reaction i uh I think the sadder part was less about the fans and more about the colleagues. I definitely lost a lot of friends. Um, there are a lot of people in the Dota space that are anti-NFT irrationally. Um, and it's just a bummer to, to think that I was friends with them when I played the game that they liked. And as soon as mm -hmm. I moved on to build something that has a higher social impact, helps more people, feeds my soul and makes me happier. Uh, you know, they see me as like a scammer or something that really sucks, you know, and that that like hurts yeah. when it's colleagues and people that mm -hmm. you have mutual respect for that you've spent years of your life, life working with and building up and growing alongside of and all that stuff. But it is what it is, you know, out with the old in with the new replace those folks with all of the amazing people that I've met in the Axie space. And I have no regrets. I, I really don't. I think my time in Dota was coming to an end and uh, I really couldn't be happier in Axie right now. Challenging, but super fun. Yeah. So, yeah, um, it, is, it is really interesting that you point out about you, you mentioned that you worry about being an outsider in the in the in the Axie community because um, I think you are one of the, you are the first visible non-founder uh, member of the Axie community that is interacting with the community right now, and you bring a lot of, of your background and expertise in esports and content creation, which brings us uh, to our first intermission of, of our show. So we have this quiz uh, right now and uh, for our audience on Facebook. So we are going to flash a question on our screen and the first one to answer will receive the price of 1000 SLP. So it will be about, so it will be about Zayori, about Axe Infinity. So we are going to test your uh, Axie Phantom. Uh, fan so yeah, so this is the question. Yeah, so first one to comment on Facebook. Um, stream will win the 1000 SLP. Okay, so I think you flashed the question. the question. Yeah, what is the name of Zeris Axie in the picture here? So, um, this is um, Zeris Axie, it is also the name of um, Zeris Yield. So, if you yeah. know, if you're if you've been following Zeris, you have noticed uh, already. So, yeah, so the first person who are who will be able to answer this on Facebook will get. Um, the price of 1000 SLP, and we will um, verify this later. So, this for those questions, yes. this is a good question. I like this. So, yeah, so uh, we have some some people that are just coming in so far. <laughs> so, for those who just arrived, we are with Zayori. Uh, so far, we talk about his background into in esports and how he got started into 
into blockchain, NFT, and Axie Infinity. So stay tuned as we are now going to deep dive more into um, their soul in Sky Mavis and answer more questions from our audience. So we we have this um, Twitter thread uh, where hmm. we ask uh, uh, and, on, and the audience there on on their questions to you. So this is the first one. Um, yeah, uh, Chin, this is uh, this is the question. Yeah. So a question from at PJPJ. What's your favorite game in the Web3 space aside from Axie? And do you miss playing or casting Dota 2? Um, Ziori, what are your thoughts on that one? Do I miss playing or casting Dota 2? Sometimes. I think that was one of those jobs where the actual casting, right? When I'm live in the match, like on LAN, in the stadium with the teams there and the live audience mm, and big stakes, um, like I, I miss that a lot. Live events are amazing. Um, and even online events, like casting is really fun. It's a really hard job because you have to take more inputs than you have bandwidth for and then turn that into a useful output. You know, you have to tell this story of there's five, 10 different heroes casting all these spells all at the same time. You can't call out all of them. So you have to in real time kind of parse what's happening and summarize the big abilities. It, it is really hard. It's like a muscle. If you take two weeks off after casting every day, you come back and you feel you feel mm -hmm. slow. You're like, what's that thing? That Earthshaker? Aftershock. That's it. You know, it's it, it's so much data to run through your brain. I miss that. You get a little addicted to that feeling because there isn't there isn't much in life that compares with that. There aren't many things that are that consuming in your brain where you just block out the rest of the world and I'm tunnel vision on this Dota match and telling the story that's in front of me. And doing that in real time, I, I've never experienced a, a bigger high than that. Um, like my most proud casting moment, I have a couple, but one of them was at TI5 when I was a hired caster during the second to last day, I think, on the main stage. Um, mm -hmm. I was casting on the, the newbie stream with Purge on the floor of the international. So our voices weren't going through the speakers, but like we cast the series where Secret got eliminated in the lower bracket. And I mm -hmm. remember just, it was like the venue was shaking, you know, like when you're there on the sideline feeling that energy, that was the ultimate high. Nothing in my life has ever compared to that moment of screaming into the microphone. I couldn't even hear my own voice because the crowd was screaming so loudly. Secret has been eliminated from the International Five. Like the gravitas of those words and yeah. how, how much of an upset it felt like to me in the moment. You just, you sort of elevate onto another plane of existence in those moments. So yeah, I missed that part. But getting there really sucks you have to put in a lot of legwork you have to cast a lot of qualifiers that are really unfun and time consuming you have to deal with a lot of technical headaches and just general oh. political discussions right it's a popularity contest you're always fighting other talent that are sort of your allies but also trying to undercut you and you know also just trying to survive so it's really brutal it's really cutthroat it's very clicky um, that part, I don't miss at all. And I think the ecosystem is set up that, you know, there's a lot of very talented people that are fighting over relative scraps when there is a ton of money in the Dota ecosystem. And I think that wears you down after a while, seeing players make millions of dollars and you're like, hey, am I going to make enough to pay rent at the end of the year? Um, and you're part of the same ecosystem. That's not a great feeling. So I don't miss that part at all. Um, favorite game in the Web3 space aside from Axie? I get asked this one a lot, and I think it's one that I officially have to say no comment on anymore <laughs> because regardless of what I say, uh, I get accused of either <laughs> punching down or, uh, uh, yeah, uh, endorsing kind of a competitor. Um, I think this is going to be the year, though, of seeing more like AAA games start to make a run in the Web3 NFT space. I think a lot of them are trying to figure out the best path to do it and how to get it to resonate with the existing gamers that they have in their audiences. Um, yeah. But I am looking forward to seeing more and more games come into the space. Um, and and there, there are some, some cool experiences that are starting to pop up. So I, I remain bullish on NFT gaming at large. I mean, I think Axie is going to stay number one for the foreseeable future. But um, there are some other cool ideas coming into the space, no doubt. Genres for everyone. Right, okay, that's true. Okay, um, now we'll move on to. Oh, there's another question here. Yeah, the next question from Escanor. He says, "Would you rather play Dota two or Axie Arena matches?" He says that you're one of my favorite analysts since I saw you on Moondock, by the way. So it's a long time fan asking this question. 
Wow. Yeah, appreciate that. Um, man, I have some great memories at Mood Duck. Like, we, we had a, a, a couple of the projects that I've worked on were really ahead of the curve and we really didn't know it. And Moon Duck was another one. Uh, when we started Moon Duck in like 2015, it was in reaction to the state of the English commentary in Dota and how boring everything was. It felt like every panel was just four dudes all trying to agree with each other and impress the world about how smart they were about Dota. And it just seemed so boring and so dry and so like not one person's fault, just a group of individuals all trying to do their best. But the end result was not what the community wanted. So we saw this opportunity to do something different, to build a culture. You remember in Dragon Ball Z when Goku just turned Super Saiyan all the time? <laughs> He's like, why waste energy on going Super Saiyan when I could just be sparkly gold 24-7? We, we wanted to do, our, like, our idea was let's do that, but with the culture of our broadcast talent. Let's take a group of people that all like each other, that all get along well, that all genuinely laugh at each other's jokes. Then doing whatever we're doing is just going to be fun by nature because we're all kind of messing around and hanging out with our friends. And if we can do that, then it'll translate very naturally on camera because it's all genuine laughter of you know four friends that are having a great time digging on each other and being unafraid to go there. And a big part of our culture was, you know, know your limits but at the same time go for it like it's almost always better to go for it and ask for an apology than it is to not go for it and ask for uh, 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 and ask for permission um we wanted people to feel comfortable like making an edgy joke but creating something that's more organic and i don't know that i've laughed more in like a fixed period of time than the moments that we've done moon duck lands like captain straps four or midas mode one or midas mode two like those events were they were such key bonding moments. When I go back and look at the highlights, yeah. I just start laughing. I start holding my side. Um, so I really appreciate that. I think I have some fond memories there, and I think we created some really, really cool stuff at Moonduck that I'm still proud of. Um, it does depend on what I'm in the mood for in terms of Axie or Dota. I play maybe one or two Dota matches a month now. My rank is super low. I'm super casual. I'm one of those guys. I do still enjoy it. Like I think Dota is a great game. It is really satisfying to hop in and play your favorite heroes in small doses, but I feel a little over it. I can't I, I used to be borderline addicted to Dota under the guise of like, I need to practice to do a bit better at my job. You know, sometimes I would go, great, I have nothing to do this weekend and just play Dota for 12 hours a day for two or three days in a row. Um, I would do these binges where I would play like 20 Dota matches consecutively and uh, like not eat and stuff. I, I can't do that anymore. I just, I don't have the motivation. I'm just not interested. I simply just don't care about my rank enough to do that. Um, Axie is great because it's short and digestible and it doesn't make me mad. You know, even if I get unlucky, it's like, it just feels like, all right, that, that was a bad match. I can queue up and play another one. If I get, if I lose three Axie matches in a row, I still feel like, ah, I can win it back. No big deal. You lose three yeah. Dota matches in a row. That ruins your whole weekend. You know, <laughs> so it really depends on what I'm in the mood for. Um, but yeah, I, I like playing Axie a lot. I think it's chill and I really like couch games. I love that I can play Axie like on my tablet yeah. and just kick back and like watch TV and wind down before bed and get a couple of arena matches in. That's something I can't do with Dota. Dota does not yeah. wind me down before bed. It's the total opposite. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Thanks for answering that question. So now we move into the content creator side of Axie Infinity. So um, as the program lead for the content creators, um, when you got into that role, what was like your first impression with like the content around Axie and the community as well? It was super raw. I think part of what attracted me to the esports side was observing this organic energy that I definitely felt in StarCraft II. Um, I think it's important when you're trying to identify budding esports, there has to be some organic traction of people that just care about competing, whether there's prize pools or not, whether there's tournaments or not. You need that group of people that are just passionate about the competition and min maxing mm -hmm. their skills and breaking the meta. And Axie totally had that. And it was very organic. And that's something I think you can use esports to amplify, but you can't use esports to create that energy if it, if it doesn't yeah. exist within your ecosystem. Um, so that was super bullish for me. I think there's a huge Venn diagram between content creators and tournament organizers, especially in the, uh, the, the Axie space where guilds have revenue streams through scholarships and the amount that you generate through scholarships is based on how well your individual scholars perform in the arena, you know, the higher MMR, the more SLP you make, it seems like esports is just a match made in heaven. Like it, even just in the lowest level of as a viewer, 
what better way to get free coaching than to watch the best players yeah. in the world and hear commentators kind of break it down. So I think my brain sort of biasly went to how can we help build up these content creators? And then how can we also start building some esports infrastructure and start seeing that intersection of enabling content creators to either run their own tournaments or partner with other people that want to run tournaments and create content around it and do commentary and start building this like esports gig economy around Axie. Um, I think when I was hired, we had like 40,000 daily active users. So they actually wanted me to help build out the creator referral program and really jumpstart the chain reaction of bringing in new users to the ecosystem. Before I could even finish modeling that out, let alone implement it, the scholarship growth machine really kicked in. Yeah. And we started seeing those huge strides to like, we just broke 100,000. We just broke 500,000. Guys, I think we're going to break a million. I was still like onboarding when that was happening. <laughs> So I was just this deer in the headlights like, wow, guys, it seems like we've got a lot of creators. And my job shifted from Sayori, we got to get more creators to Sayori, just try to handle the inbound from the creators that we have to Sayori, just just keep paddling, keep your head above water, just answer as many questions as you can. So it quickly jumped from, wow, we've got some really passionate people here, but I'd love to see a few more to we have so many content creators, I can't respond to all of the messages and questions on a daily basis. It it blew up almost like overnight. Um, so it was almost hard for me to assess. I, I really felt like I spent the first couple of months at Axie just, just trying as hard as I could to keep up with the inbound uh, coming to my inbox every day. And, and it was a serious yeah. struggle. But it did really um, like kind of blow my mind how, how passionate people were, how eager our creators were to create and build, and how fast they were iterating. You know, some of these folks like Elijah, you know, I feel like he's cycling through things at, at turbo speed, like stuff that took me five years to get over in my career. He's already been like, nope, figured it out, moving on. Yep, I'm CEO of Meditate now. You know, he shifted from I want to be the best player in the world to maybe I want to start an esports organization to maybe I want to be CEO of the best esports organization in Axie. And seeing him understand, like, I'm only one person, but if I build an organization, I can empower other people and start to visualize that scaling and then also take meaningful steps to realize that vision, like, in less than a year. That is amazing. I mean, that's like entrepreneurial hyperbolic time chamber. I don't know what's going on with all these Dragon Ball Z references, but um, yeah, it's really incredible. I, I think our content creators have a huge amount of passion and um, the, the, the key for my side has been trying to figure out how to enable that, amplify that, harness that, and you know, keep people motivated when we're in these, these kind of gap periods, like between esports grants, uh, before uh, Axie Origin, and like, there just isn't that much new stuff going on in Axie because it's an alpha. Yeah. And sometimes we have these moments where it's like, hey, man, we're just working on upgrading the servers. Not really much to meme about there. It's just <laughs> it's boring, necessary work to take our stuff to the next level. So, um, yeah, a big part of my job has been trying to, you know, mentor and help content creators wherever I can um, and help them navigate navigate these these kind of unprecedented water, uh, waters that we're entering. Yeah. And speaking of like helping content creators, you guys hosted the first ever Axie Infinity Creators Cup in the Philippines. If I'm not mistaken, that's the first ever Creators Cup. And you live casted uh, in an in English stream. Uh, but were there any insights that you learned when you hosted that event, uh, especially with regards to like Filipino content creators and um, streaming? Yeah, so it's it's part of this roadmap where we're trying to ramp up esports uh, over time and try to build organic traction. You know, we have millions of players, but only like thousands of viewers when it comes to esports. So how can we start bridging that gap? I think that's a big question we're trying to solve. Um, the Creator Cup was this idea of what we were sort of calling internally esports light. Um, mm. It's not a full fledged esports tournament with the best players in the world competing for like the world championship. It is still a competitive tournament, but it's more focused around, uh, you know, content creators, lifestyle influencers. And in the case of the Philippines, it was one of few areas in the world where Axie is popular enough that we have folks that are on TV, you know, people like yeah. Ian and Myrtle and Yasi and Bornock and Eric Ty that they all play Axie. A lot of them are streamers and, you know, they're, they're gamers as well. But a lot of those people, if you're in Southeast Asia, the Philippines, like 
they're they're legitimate actors or actresses like doing big activations with with sponsorship deals that are very plugged into Filipino culture. And it okay. seemed like an amazing opportunity to start bridging these worlds where we can take these lifestyle influencers. Uh, we know that they're really good on camera. We know that they're very animated and natural. And it just seemed like a really good fit to try to put them together in a tournament that would hopefully be entertaining, very digestible for the viewers. You know, we did some of the like game show content in between to try to show off some of their personalities. Um, yeah. So I, I think it was a really successful event. I think the viewership definitely exceeded expectations. Uh, we knew that the, the Filipino fans would you know, show up and support. We didn't know to what degree. And I think uh, the Filipino stream peaked at like 44, 45,000 concurrent viewers in the grand finals. So that's, that's pretty bullish. That, that's pretty damn good. Um, was definitely impressed with the, the quality of the competitors. Uh, I think Hizalia taking place was or taking first place was really exciting and really bullish. We had the last series go uh, the stretch. Like I think it was seven games uh, at best of seven that actually went eight games because there was a draw mixed in there. So um, I think it was a great showcase of what Axie yeah. can do from an esports perspective. Uh, and that's just going to get better with V3 and Origin around the corner. So it, it was a great starter event for our, our esports stuff. Right. And are you eyeing to um, host more of these types of Creator Cup series for Axe Infinity? Yeah, I think we want to have a balance where we want the esports system to have uh, a lot of first party like Sky Mavis official tournaments to provide this backbone, like eventually working up towards an Axie Pro League that sets the stage mm. for the whole circuit. But we very much want to bring in third parties. Like I think the way Dota does things uh, in that regard is very good, where you have these majors and minors that are owned by third party operators, but Valve gives them the seal of approval, they give them some money for the prize pool, and they make it an official part of the circuit so that the tournaments have weight in terms of getting to the international. So I think that's a model we want to emulate to some degree. and. They're, the first steps are us running more tournaments. I think the Creator Cups are something we'll do um, in select regions at specific yeah. times. I don't think we're going to be doing like a Creator Cup like twice a year or something regular like that. It's meant to basically be an expanded show match. So when we have the, you know, the right culture with the right partner, with the right influencers, and it makes sense, I think the Creator Cups are a really cool idea. But they're definitely secondary to the broader mission of building out the primary esports infrastructure. Uh, and we're going to be doing more of that later this year. Origin is really the big unlock for our esports initiatives moving forward. Um, the, the game is just more robust in terms of like having a lobby system, potentially building in a tournament system into the game client. That won't be there at launch, but it's something that I've been pushing for a lot internally. Um, and also just the upgraded graphics and battle mechanics, like getting rid of random crits. That is one of the most bullish things for Axie Esports I can think of. We're just removing RNG elements and, and adding more skill elements. I think that just makes Axie Esports better and it makes it more appealing to the average person. Um, so yeah, that's, that's partially why we've been maybe a little bit slow to go super big with Esports stuff. Um, we've wanted to try to time those big unlocks alongside the Origin release as well. So I think this is the tip of the iceberg of some of the esports yeah. stuff that we have uh, have on the drawing board. Right, Ziori. And just circling back with like content creators, especially here in the Philippines, you know, um, if you've seen Axe Archipelago, it shows like the different guilds here just in the Philippines, and you can see like it's all over um, the country. Um, with streaming and like these content creators, do you see like an opportunity to support? Um, people who want to start streaming in different dialects here in the Philippines because there's a lot of dialects here and you know to reach um, mm. some other areas or other people that aren't familiar with like English or Tagalog which is commonly used do you see an opportunity for um, that type of projects or support for content creators yeah th this is a big one to unpack um, we get a ton of requests for Axie to be translated to different languages natively. And I totally understand it. I, if you don't speak mm. English, it's a huge bottleneck to learn yeah. the game. Um, it's a huge challenge just to keep all of the cards and aspects uh, up to date in proper English so that it is very clear what the mechanics do and what's going on. Uh, once you start adding in other languages, then you need a team of people to not only create it, but then manage it and keep it updated as new cards come out, as cards get changed, as mechanics get changed. And that is just a time consuming process. And I think from our side, if we commit to a language, 
we want to be like to us that means we're committed to it and keeping it up to date it's a lot more than just one time translating all of the cards into another language um and it's also you know that it's not going to be right the first time there's always going to be typos or little things that need to be adjusted yeah. sometimes translations can be a little bit subjective so that is a back and forth process as you get feedback from users saying hey th this is wrong or this needs to be updated somebody has to own that and be able to move it up the ladder and then actually push those changes so you need leads across all these different dialects um i think like long term it's something we're aspiring for i think we want axi to be um more interoperable and accessible to everyone uh, it's just a question of how to best do that and make sure it's not a drain on our resources. So that balance there can be really tricky uh, and it gets extra tricky to try to uh, gauge like at what point do we start servicing more dialects within a specific language or culture or country compared to bringing on like another entire language that, um, you know, uh, might be more standalone, you know, like French or German or something where it's a, a smaller demographic, but uh, there are still a lot of speakers and, um, you know, also trying to forecast growth because it takes time to to build that, you know, what regions are we trying to hedge our bets against where we're seeing really big growth and maybe that makes sense in the future. So that's a really long and kind of lame way to say maybe. Uh, I can definitely say for sure that there is a lot of internal discussion about how to approach this and build a system around it. Um, and we hear you loud and clear that we need Axie in more languages than just English, but no promises on which languages or any timelines around that. Yeah. yeah. So uh, thank you for that. And thank you for bringing up uh, eSports, which is our core topic for today. So um, this year alone, uh, Sky may be eSports, the key focus for Axie Infinity Games. So as what we see here, 75 or 7,500 EXS with seven plus events uh, through the first or the second quarter of this year. This all being greenlighted. It is available on the eSports page of the of your of the Axis Substack, I think. And then um, it is organized into ongoing leagues, um, global tournaments and regional tournaments. So you already mentioned like the motivation behind um plan. So um what is um I guess my question now is what is the difference um, or is there any difference at all when you organize for esports in other games versus in um, events here in Axie Infinity? Um every game has a couple of little quirks in terms of exactly you know how do we spectate or like access the live matches um how do we position the overlays so that it's not covering key information you know uh player expectations in terms of building a format since right now we don't have an official axie competitive mode uh, like in dota we've got all pick and then captain's mode that kind of thing we don't have that yet for axie so i think tournaments have been sort of creating that on their own. We just saw the Beat Invitational do one where you show up with 10 axes, and then before your series with an opponent, you both get to remove one axe from the other person's pool, and then you use those nine remaining um, throughout the like, best of three or best of five that you're playing in. I think this is something that is unique to Axie, right? As a tournament organizer, you need to understand the game well enough to be able to design a format that makes sense and resonates with the players and has like competitive integrity in mind. But the nuts and bolts of it are pretty much the same, right? A bracket is a bracket. A group stage is a group stage. Um, all esports have this kind of nature of you put people in a bracket, they get matched up against each other, they report results. You need some kind of tournament administrator to manage um, either conflicts when one person says, I won, and the other person says, no, I won, um, or complaints when somebody can't find their way or they show up late or you have to disqualify someone. I think all of that kind of basic administration stuff is, is pretty ubiquitous if you have any experience running tournaments before. And I think that's part of the energy behind these grants is while we're still ramping up our esports engine on the developer side, we want to give people opportunities to run experiments, try different formats, and just get their feet wet in the esports space. I think it's one thing to say, I want to run a tournament. That looks really fun and easy. It's a totally different experience to actually sit down and do it and experience that live stress. It's certainly not for everyone. Um, and I think this is a great time for people to do a little trial and error, maybe make some small mistakes and, and correct course before uh, the stakes rise. You know, um, There's just going to be more eyeballs and more people coming in. So this is a really good time to yeah. um, you know, run some, some tests on, uh, of your own. And I think that's what we've been encouraging a lot of these grant recipients to do. Yes. And um, speaking of people that are joining, and I, I mentioned some of these um, events are have open club qualifiers, like basically anyone, everyone can join. Obviously, people who are already into Axie and NFT, 
and even crypto are naturally excited and, and wanting to yeah. join these esports events right so um but um what are you do what perhaps the question here is what are what are you doing to attract you know the bigger esports market so as i remember is a is a large um, esports country popular esports here is popular and um yeah I'm just wondering are awards um are access awards and you know you know um and up as an in for uh, for the general more esports uh, people to come and try yeah, so a big part of, of our esports system is distributing AXS. It is worth a lot of USD if you try to convert it, but it's a governance token. So part of the Axie universe um, is this DAO nature and becoming more decentralized. So once Axie is governed by AXS holders, we want to make sure that the AXS tokens are in the hands of people that actually care about the ecosystem. And w one part of that is if you're a, an esports competitor, if you're pushing the meta and winning tournaments, you're probably pretty committed. And that's not to say you're not going to take some profits or cash out some of those prize pools. But I think there's a, a higher chance that you're more likely to be interested in governance and using your voice to shape the ecosystem in a powerful kind of scalable way. Um, I think that's appealing to outside organizations as well. Um, I have to be a little careful here. I can't reveal specific names and I really wish I could because I think it would make you really excited. But I've had several calls with some really high profile, very reputable like S tier esports organizations. And a lot of them are sold on Web3 and NFT gaming from a really high level, like the, you know, the CEO or like the leaders of the organization believe in it. And they're currently going through the process of selling the concept internally and getting their employees and everyone else on board to believe in the potential of this technology. And I think a lot of them are very excited and bullish about Axie, and they're just waiting for us to deploy more infrastructure. Some of them have said, hey, as soon as there's a way for us to get a skin in the game, like literally a skin in the game, and then have skin in the game um, and have a revenue stream directly to the game client, like we're in. Let me know as soon as you can do that. I've had others say, let us know when Axie Pro League starts. Like when Origin is out and you guys are announcing million dollar tournaments, all of a sudden I can justify to my investors spending on uh, you know, Axie Infinity players and building up an Axie Infinity Pro team so that we can compete for those prize dollars. And most of them will say, I believe that you guys are going to do it. I want to start building now, but this is a business and I have to be able to go to my investors and say, there is a potential return here if we do this right. If we can mentor the best player in the world, this is going to be profitable for the organization and leverageable for us to sell sponsorships and you know whatever else you need to do to, to make your team business work. So that's really exciting for me. And that kind of to, points me towards we need to just get this foundation right. We need to move slow and steady and build a really stable esports stack uh, that has a strong foundation and strong fundamentals. And if we can do that, the big teams are going to start coming in in droves. And I think in esports, there's this dynamic where nobody wants to be the first and nobody wants to be the last. So you'll see this hesitation. And then as soon as a couple tier one organizations make the move, yeah. all of the others will be afraid to be left behind and they'll start making big moves to come in and start buying out players and, you know, battling over the perceived most valuable competitors in the ecosystem. I think that's coming. Like, I think this is the quiet before the storm. And six months from now, 12 months from now, 18 months from now, the esports ecosystem is going to look a lot different and we'll have a lot more recognizable orgs coming in, trying to build build guilds, build scholarships um, and get their brand out there from a competitive competitive perspective that is super exciting like team secret is already building an axie scholarship i i did a, mm -hmm. a podcast with their ceo um on one of their their main channels just to try to educate um traditional gamers about the the value proposition of what you, of what we're building but that alone to me is like the writing's on the wall these big teams see the value and they're just trying to figure out how do we present this in a way that won't completely alienate our existing audience yeah that is really you know I would like to bring you in, on this particular part of our slide. So you mentioned something about a three-way chicken and egg issue between uh, players and casters and organizers. So obviously here in the Philippines, we are, a, we are a Facebook country. A lot of us are streamers. A lot of us are content creators. Like you mentioned here that part of the reason why this grant has been um, created was to make sure that you know more casters to come up, you know, up the limelight. So um, can you um, explain a bit more of this um, chicken and egg issue and about um, coming yeah. out for, for the casters? Totally. So there's a, a triad that happens in esports where you need players, casters, and 
Um, well, really, you need players, organizers, and fans. I think that's the, the right way to break it down. So um, in any esports system, think of it almost like this triangle, and all three of them have to extract some value out of the system. You have to have players, like you have to have enough prize dollars where it's worth the time of the players to become a professional player, train, compete. And that has to be like equal ish or ideally positive expected value for your average player that's trying to compete. Um, you have to have fans that are there watching the events and getting some enjoyment out of the system. Uh, like one of the, the parts of this conversation that always gets fun is instant replay. Okay, it's going to cost us $50,000 to have instant replay for the tournament. Okay, is that worth it? Are, well, is there any viewer that will not watch the tournament because we don't have instant replay? It's like, no, probably not. That's not a deal breaker for most viewers. But what, what is the value add? Does instant replay add enough value for $50,000 that um, it makes viewers more excited, more sticky, it helps them understand the story, then how do we like measure that increase in their engagement, right? That's very hard, but we know it's important. We know that fan engagement is a key part of monetizing the ecosystem. Then of course, there's the tournament organizer and the tournament organizer isn't a charity either. They have to have enough uh, potential in the system to sell sponsors and at least break even or ideally be a little bit profitable so that there's an incentive for them to run future events. So all three of these things have to stay in balance. You can't just spend all of your money and do it all for the fans because then you'll go bankrupt. As an organizer, you can't just take all the money and maximize your profits because then you won't have fans or players in the future. You can't overpay the players because then you'll go bankrupt, but you have to pay the players as much as you can because you want to get the best players possible to get the most viewers possible to then sell as many sponsors as possible. So like this wheel kind of turns as you try to scale your esports enterprise. Um, and you, there isn't really a good starting point, right? You don't have tournaments without the viewers to tune in because that's where all the money comes from through advertising. And you don't really have players if there aren't any tournaments to participate in because there's no ecosystem to keep them engaged and no incentive to practice. And if there's no players, then there's no reason for fans to give a shit about anything because there's no pro players to watch in the first place. So this is basically the three-way chicken and the egg of launching a new esports ecosystem. Even if that organic energy is there that we talked about, mm -hmm. uh, you have to build up all three of these pillars kind of in tandem with each other. You need casters and you need to, to give them an incentive to practice and get some hours on the mic and start building their brands. Same with players and then same with tournament organizers. It's not easy to run tournaments. It takes a lot of logistical effort. Uh, it takes a lot of planning. It takes a lot of heads up reaction because it happens in real time and things can yeah. go wrong and you have to deal with it in the moment. Um, so it, it's no one individual's fault. You know, it's not like, uh, you can blame a tournament organizer for assessing the space and going, hey, it's not worth it. There aren't enough viewers in this in this game for me to justify the cost of running a tournament. So as the the developer on the Sky, Sky Mavis side, our goal has been to try and stimulate this a little bit, inject some money in with the esports grants. This takes some risk away from the tournament organizers because we're supplying the prize pool for them. So really, it's just their time and effort that they stand to lose, less the financial side. So that gives them an incentive to try to run some experiments and tournaments. And then they have to hire casters. And then all of a sudden, we have players that are now really excited to commit more time to Axie because they can look at the schedule and go, wow, there's a tournament every single weekend that I could compete in. If I want to commit to this and go full-time Axie, now I actually have a path to do that if I'm the best player in the world and I can start winning some of these tournaments and build a reputation for myself. So yeah, it's all about creating these storylines and creating opportunities for players, casters, and organizers alike, because we need all three of them, man. The, the esports system doesn't work if, if one of those three parties decides to hit the road. Yeah. Thank you so much for that. And move on to some of the of the points that was discussed in the in the esports um in the esports by Sky Mavis last January. So just bring up here three. Uh, for example, the event must have at least twenty percent of their final participants in open from open qualifiers. So um and then you need to have some high definition live stream, which yeah. is essential of course for every match and but uh, what I'm seeing here is that the last two rounds should be um, in English, um, Spanish, Portuguese, Tagalog. So, if the event, um, if, if if I ask, so if the event is a bit um, you know, Philippine centric, um, centered to the Philippines, so do we still need to do um, 
you know other countries language so i assume many um older people uh, you know some of us here also know spanish but um you still for languages um, to do the cast or to, to, to yeah. receive a grant or something yeah so it, this is a really good question and a lot of people asked about this when we announced it i think the gap that i identified after the first grant was that a lot of the events we greenlit didn't even try to find casters for other languages um, and this is more of a big deal like specifically when it comes to english like hey we'll, we'll give you money to do a french tournament and then they provided a stream only in french and part of me felt like well there's a lot of content creators out and that's a tournament that i get messages from content creators saying hey how come there was no english stream for that tournament i i had nothing to do i had no content to make i would have gladly streamed those matches just just to have unique content on my channel. I mean, if nobody's doing it, this just seems like a waste. And I, I kind of agree with that. Um, four languages is a pretty big, big thing. But I think the key note there, or big requirement rather, the key note is that they don't all have to be studio level. Uh, I think the first step is like reaching out to other streamers and just saying, hey, we're doing this tournament. Does anybody want to cover it in Spanish? We're looking for someone to do that and we can help use our social media channels to promote your stream and let people know that you're covering it. Um, four languages might be a little too much. It goes back to the language thing we talked about before. How do we decide? You know, like, is Portuguese worth it? Do we have enough Portuguese players that it's worth it to have a Portuguese caster for every single tournament? I honestly don't know the answer to that question. And I think that's why we decided to go for it. Let's conduct the experiment. Let's see what happens. And if we have to, like we're just now seeing the first round of events in the grant, if the feedback comes back, like this is too much, we can't find casters, nobody wants to do this, the time zones are too much, um, we might dial it back and say, okay, you have to do it in your primary language and then plus one of your choice. It could be English, it could be Spanish, or maybe we say you need to do English in your primary and then you need one more after that you can pick the language. It can be basically any language out there. Um, we might need to calibrate it a little bit, but I think the idea is to try to get some cross-pollination across the Axie cultures, especially when it comes to esports. What I'm, I'm really trying to avoid and plant seeds against is Axie esports becoming this very siloed region versus region thing. I think if we're building a digital nation, we don't want our digital nation to be tribal by definition. And like, it's the Filipino guy versus the Spanish guy. Like. I understand that culture is an important part of the storylines, but I don't think we want to make it this culture versus culture thing. I don't think we want it to be a combative. I speak Spanish, so I only know the Spanish speaking players. I speak English, so I only mm -hmm. know the Spanish speaking players. I think there's amazing stories across all of our different cultures in Axie. And I want to try to encourage people to take steps to tell those stories across different cultures. I want some people in South America to be fans of some players in the Philippines and vice versa. And to me, at least getting some casters and streamers to cover these events is like the very first step down that road. Um, so we'll see. I think the, the thing that I really want to echo here is that I definitely see this as an experiment. I think uh, Stuart and I, he's our esports manager, are being very diligent about listening to feedback, collecting feedback from all the tournament organizers and making sure that we adjust quickly if needed. So um, we're here to work with you. We want all of our tournament organizers to succeed. We have to write the grants to be a little bit stern and strict because we don't want to get 10,000 applicants from people that have never run tournaments before. But once you're approved, like we're here to help. You know, If you come to us and say, hey, I can't find a Portuguese caster, our response isn't find one or you're not going to get your grant. It's OK, no problem. Here's a list of people we know that are good. Here's a list of people that we think could be available. Contact them. Let us know if you can't find anything, and then we'll figure it out from there. Um, our goal is to enable people to succeed and you know see Axie Esports thrive across many different cultures. So um, just remember that with those parameters. Like We're on your team. If you're an Axie tournament organizer, you're doing good work, you've got a great rule set, and you're trying to deliver the best experience possible, we're right there with you, and, and we're willing to help as much as we can. Yes, thank you so much. And now, um, here it is. Um, you know, the Ooh. combination of all of our uh, up to today. So, with esports becoming, you know, a priority and origin being just around the corner. So, in fact, I was in the Twitter space um, early, and yeah. it, it appears that Gio mentioned something about when it will go live. But, you know, Zayari, how does esports um, uh, in NFT gaming will change? And do you think this change? when Axie Infinity Origin releases? So there's there's three main things I often point to about why 
blockchain uh, is leading us to a potential revolution for esports 2.0. One of them is the self-funding, and we kind of hinted at this earlier in terms of why I wanted to join the space. But um, Sky Mavis was very smart about how they did the allocation of the AXS token, and most of it is locked up and these different treasuries like the community treasury and one of them is the play to earn fund so we have over a billion dollars in the play to earn fund that we can use for like season rewards for tournament rewards basically to build out this infrastructure so that's a lot of runway i can run a lot of tournaments and a lot of leagues over the next 10 years with a billion dollars to play with uh, obviously not all of that is is earmarked for esports but it means that i don't have to sell sponsors i don't like to make this thing happen it means that we can fund it ourselves and commit to an esports roadmap and then bring on sponsors and partners that are good for us good for our community, sell products that we believe in, and are helping us achieve our goals of building a digital nation and increasing digital property, property rights for gamers. That's really big. Uh, traditional esports is very much backed by sponsorship dollars from uh, a, a spectrum of, of brands, some more reputable than others. Um, the second is this ability to distribute money on the blockchain. When your user account is also your wallet address, uh, like your bank account, it makes it really easy for us to distribute prize pool, uh, especially in like qualifier type scenarios. Imagine if you start accumulating a prize purse just by winning rounds in the open qualifiers for Axie Pro League. You don't make it into the you know the regional playoff round, but you know you're two rounds short. Maybe you're able to accumulate 0.8 AXS or something. In the past, that was never really possible because of all the logistical work it takes to collect all that payment information and then the cost to send money globally. Even like a $5 fee on PayPal to send $50 to someone, it, it doesn't feel very scalable and it's kind of manual in nature. In this case, we could build a tournament bracket that's integrated with your, your Ronin account. And then when the tournament's done, we just click, yes, yeah, send prize pool. And that Ronin or that, you know, that AXS is distributed on Ronin to anybody that participated. That actually allows us to take meaningful steps towards esports for everyone. Historically, esports has been gated um, as this like upper elite, like 0.0001% of players get access to the prize pool. If we could even get access to 1%, or 10% of participants in a giant open qualifier. That's that's literally a game changer compared to anything that's existed in esports before. Um, so I think that is really exciting. Uh, and the last one is just being able to utilize smart contracts for increased transparency. Again, to go back to the Dota 2 space that's driven largely by third parties, there are a huge amount of third party tournament organizers that have not paid out the prize pools that they promised. There have been a number of people that have come in and said, hey, guys, 250 thou, come on down. Let's do an awesome tournament here in Southeast Asia. And then the players show up, the casters show up, they run an awesome tournament, they get all these viewers. Then as soon as the tournament's done, they go, actually, we don't have that money. Sorry, we lost an investor. So we'll let you know if we find another one. But good luck to you. Thanks for playing. And then the tournament or the tournament's over. The players are stuck and they don't really have much leverage. It's really expensive to sue an organization internationally. The contracts are often messy when it comes to esports. A lot of the players are underrepresented. Uh, and that's a case where you wonder, like, did those tournaments even have that money to begin with? Uh, and in the case of smart contracts and blockchain, at the very least, you could lock that money in escrow. As a tournament organizer with no reputation or strides, you could come in and say, hey, we're going to put $100,000 into this tournament. We're going to put it in this smart contract to prove that the $100,000 exists. There, these are the triggers in which it will be released. Here's the Oracle that's going to help us to verify that external data and bring it on chain. And once it's all verified, it's good to go. And that money is going to be sent out. Um, that's not completely foolproof, right? Like con or smart contracts don't prevent uh, human greed and and they like, save us completely from the human condition but it's just one more tool in our chest like right now if a new tournament organizer comes up and and says hey here's my my prize pool it's really just a promise and we're all just going all right i hope so like send me a screenshot of your bank account i guess and even that feels very like what is this? You know, you can edit screenshots. Is this actually proof that they have this money? Is this actually proof that they're going to use this money for, for the thing that they say they're going to use it for? So 
just utilizing smart contracts and code to make things a little bit more transparent, I think that gives us more tools to solve a really big issue in existing third-party esports. So those are the big three for me that um, make me really bullish on like, this isn't just, hey, yeah, we swapped in some NFTs and we're doing esports over here. Like, I really believe that Web3 is giving us the tools to build esports 2.0 and usher in this next generation of players that have a totally different lens and amount of leverage in the ecosystem. So I'm really excited about that. I spent a lot of years watching players get kicked around in the Dota 2 space, some of them struggling to make ends meet after sacrificing a decade of their life. Um, you know, not everybody's going to make it. It is risky to be a pro player, but seeing the system kind of work against some of these people that sacrificed it all, that was really hard. And uh, I'm, I'm very excited to try to, to build a, a better system. There's got to be a better way, I think. Yeah. Um Thank you so much for bringing that up now on, on about the on, on about yeah. esports and blockchain. You know, we have actually a on how actually blockchain, the transparent as it is, can actually basically for for players, for example, can they can easily verify. Um, and they get good. There there are fans really. That is the first one, right? So um, and then for Ronin, there is this particular app called Scatter, like the the Axie team or the team can just um you know distribute um SOPs or AXS um, to the participants or to the winners right so um I guess this brings me to the next point like you know Zayor, the crypto space as you know um is a right and the market is always um in cycles so um we have these exciting new developments we have esports we have origin but it's actually going to whether um these um these cycles in the in the crypto market at at at, at this point and in the future uh, so you, you cut out a little bit for me there. Was the question about like how we handle bear markets? Yes. Yeah, so how about when when there are cycles in the market? How are how how is actually going yes, in, in the future? Yeah. So I I think at the highest level we're definitely product first. So we're not looking to chase any specific bear market. Um, we don't like rush out product because your tokens are pumping or anything like that. I think to a large degree, our product cycle is our product cycle. We're focused on quality and some things just take as long as they take to get right. Um, I think when the bear markets hit, you know, Axie was created in a bear market. So we, we feel comfortable there. We feel at home. In some ways, it's easier to build in a bear market because the people you're engaging with are the true believers. Uh, and when the bull market hits, there's a huge increase in speculators and people that want to come in to try to make a quick profit uh, that might not understand the fundamentals and um, will just dive in head first. Um, I definitely saw during the bull market people buying into SLP thinking it was a governance token, not understanding that it's a game token with an unlimited supply. Um, I got a lot of messages from people saying like, this is unfair. I bought this token thinking that it was a governance token and it would go up. But now that I see how your emissions work, I feel like this isn't fair for me because I don't play the game. And if you pause for a moment, think about how ridiculous that is to be mad about a game emitting game tokens to the actual players of the game and how that's unfair to speculators that don't even play the game that's kind of the point. Uh, that's sort of what the token's supposed to do. Um, so I think bear markets do insulate you from that dynamic at least a little bit. Nothing prevents it completely, but um, people are just a little more diligent and a little slower to act, which I think can be a good thing in a space like this that moves really fast. I think for us, when bear markets hit, it really becomes an opportunity for user education uh, to try mm -hmm. to, to carry people through their first bear market experience. I went through it multiple times. It is really scary. It's hard to look at your investment and go, oh my gosh, I'm down 75%. What am I going to do? Um, and I don't think there is anything that replaces that psychology and getting through that and seeing it recover and um, just experiencing that and having to fight against your own psychology to buy high and sell low, it takes some discipline. It takes some practice. And no matter how much you read and how logical you are, you still have to go through that experience for the first time. Um, it is it is very unique and, and highly emotional. That's, that's the, the hardest part, right? Separating the emotions from the logic in these scary times. So I think um, we really want to use those opportunities to try to educate people. I think we always want to push people to make smart financial decisions and smart investments. You should never you know, take a loan or leverage credit 
to buy something that is very volatile or risky in nature. You should never put more into crypto than you can afford to lose because all of this is very experimental. We're an alpha by definition. So things are still being designed. Things are still being implemented. Things are still being changed. That's that's part of the roller coaster. And there are big rewards for being an early adopter like everyone that's playing Axie right now. But being an early adopter definitely comes with some additional risks. Uh, because there's just a lot of unknown, right? Things are changing in real time. So it's really important that people remember all of these things um, and don't get caught up in the FOMO of trying to chase a bear market or chase a bull market. So um, we're very slow and steady. I think a, a maxim that we get tossed around the office a lot is this is a marathon, not a sprint. Make sure you don't burn out trying to sprint. We're in this for the long haul. We're, you know, we're building tools from the ground up and we can't lose sight of that. So when in doubt, we, we do tend to, to uh, focus on quality and making sure something is exactly right rather than trying to hit an arbitrary deadline. Right. So yeah, thank you for that, Zayori. And now we move on to um, for just on one another piece uh, for this particular um, for our show. So we are going to flash again this um whoever gets to answer first uh will get the price of one thousand SLP. So um yeah uh, on our Facebook page whoever gets to uh answer correctly. So the question is um who is the winner of the first creator's cup? So I assume everyone knows it so whoever uh, gets oh, it correctly. This is a good one. I even mentioned it earlier. I spoiled the <laughs> question for you guys. This is a good pop quiz to see who is paying attention. Yeah, yeah. so um, so we are going to, to just verify and then um i think someone already did but thank you for that and um i guess we we are a bit over time but Zeri, can you please like do you still have time to answer some questions that yeah I, I could do a few more I've, I've got about 10 minutes left uh now yeah. your real question though is it looks like the first person who answered it had a misspelling so will that oh, no. one count as the official answer are, are z's and s's uh that important stay tuned to find out as the administration team here makes an executive decision <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for that. So yeah, so we have this question later. So um I guess this is very much of uh, uh in your in your in your capacity as an esports in, in esports and career. Um on that that one, sorry. So uh, Oh yeah, that question. Ooh, this is, this is not the question, but let's just go with this one now. <laughs> yeah. This is a really interesting question that we got from our follower. Uh, no, from Twitter actually. So we asked them like what do you, what do you want to ask Yori? And this one at run before you die. Um this person asked how big would Axis be in real life as animals? I don't know if there's like a common decision by the Axi team with regards to this question. Maybe you can let us know Yori, but what is the answer to this one? Yeah, well I, I definitely have to be careful because we're in the process of building out lore. Um we mm -hmm. we have a job listing, I think, right now for a lore master. So if you're a gamer, if you're a writer and you're very creative and love coming up with canon and building universes, uh check out the career page, Sky Mavis, and definitely consider applying. We need a lore master. We need a lore expert. Uh, some of the stuff we worked on internally, I think, is really good. Uh, I'm actually working on a, a little like Zayori Axie comic book series that is not official canon, but I'm hoping it'll be a little bit of a, a motivator for other people to open up their you know, creative juices when it comes to uh, Lunasia and the storylines of their most prized axes. I can't wait to go on an adventure with my mystic. Uh, but this is a really good question. Like, how big are axes really? Um, and one of the other questions that we've ta talked around, tossed around is like, are there humans in Lunasia, right? So like, oh. will we ever even get to see that scale? I think I had originally pictured a little bit bigger, you know, maybe like 30 pounds or something, kind of like a medium sized dog. Um, and then I remember seeing Jiho's profile picture of like the Axie yeah. like, on top of his head or like on his yeah. shoulder. And um, as I went through this, I think when I changed all my profile pictures, like my Twitter banner is me laying on the ground with Axies like sitting mm. on me. And yeah, the original that. version of that, I had the Axies much bigger. And then I looked at Jiho's picture and I kind of scaled it to try to max, match Jiho. And it's kind of ironic because in my head, I'm thinking like, oh, well, this guy's the expert. Clearly, I need to follow the lore. And I am probably willing to guess that Jiho just just randomly, randomly scaled some axes to make it fit the frame. And, you know, I'm way overthinking it. Um, but I did, did picture them a, a little bit bigger, almost like watermelon size, kind of something that like you'd struggle to hold more than two of them in your arms or something if you were walking around. It seems like others visualize them a little bit smaller. Um, it seems like axes are very like 
kind of ingenious, very engineering type focused, very tinkery, very innovative. So I'm excited to see the lore built out of like if axes are a little bit smaller, how do they how do they build stuff in their world? You know, do they use ladders? Do they stack on top of each other? Like how do axes actually operate in Nasia? I think that's a really interesting thing to visualize and start toying around with. So yeah, a small to medium sized dog. Is that is that a fair <laughs> answer? Something like that? Right. And that's for your personal opinion. So uh, we'll see yes. more into that once the lore um, gets developed for Axie. All right. Okay. Yeah, I think we I just have. Just remember, yeah, we, uh, yeah. Just remember uh, the the thing in Pokemon world. Well, uh, what do people in the Pokemon world eat? Right. So something like that. <laughs> <laughs> so, so this is one question from from Daniel. So, let's say successful. When do you think the esports tournament will be? So I think he's talking about like physical event. So are you envisioning something like this yeah. to happen in the future? Uh, I saw the 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 the, the esports page wherein you're mentioning that there would be some more stricter requirements if ever you're going to that direction. So um, yeah. yeah. So I think this year we definitely want to do something big for the end of the year. It won't be a full fledged like Axie Pro League. Um, I'm unsure about the exact timeline. Of, okay, when will Origin be fully launched? Like, when's it going to be in app stores? When will when will season one of Origin start? Right. I don't know the answer exactly to these questions, so it's hard to say. Like, will it be in December? Or will it be closer to like August or something? I, I actually don't know. But I think this will be the first year that we're able to do something larger that maybe feels like a miniature version of what the Axie Pro League could be in 2023 and 2024. Um, we, we don't KYC or region lock, but I think there will be some form of regional qualifiers uh, for different languages, certainly for time zone convenience, so you're not playing overnight and that kind of stuff. Um, I wish I could share more details about it, but we're, we're just not quite ready and I don't want to overpromise. Um, I think the general format we're looking at, though, to get things started will be like a three phase, like an open qualifier phase, sort of like a regional playoff, almost like group stage phase, um, and then like a finals, you know, the top four from each region go to the finals and then we have that final like, you know, showdown bracket or, or whatever it is. Uh, and that leads us on the path to like the world champion. So. Uh, that's the cadence that we want to get into. We're definitely excited about building out some version of AxiCon. I don't know where, I don't know when, but there is a lot of interest and energy to deliver like a physical Axi event. And I think if we were to do that, there would definitely be a big esports component attached to that because, I mean, hey, what else are we going to do on land, right? Let's get some esports in between the panels. Mm -hmm. So um, very open-ended again, but uh, we are working on some big stuff. And I think 2023 will definitely be a big year for esports. This year is like the, the starter. So um, we're going to calibrate accordingly. Uh, I think there was a second half to that question that I forgot, but. Um... Yeah, um, yeah, I think that's more on the on the physical events. Like, it, is it going to be gander or what? I, I think you actually already answered. Mm, okay. Yeah. yeah, we want to do physical events. I, I think that's, that's the desire. I think the Creator Cup was like a great proof of concept. Like, we need players on LAN. It adds so much to the viewer experience. It adds a lot to the player experience. Uh, it's just a matter of how do we do it safely with COVID and, you know, with a budget that is, is reasonable. You know, bubbles are very expensive, all that kind of stuff. So it seems like we're trending in a good direction globally in terms of COVID, but we'll see how it goes. We're continuing to, to monitor. But yeah, uh, both for me personally and the team internally, we're super excited to get back to physical events and people on site. Thank you so much for that, sir. So before uh, you, you mentioned your, your final message, we're just going to raffle the YGG swag box teams and say that, no? So, um, yeah, so thank you so much for all that commented. So, Ooh, the live drawing. This is sick. I love this. <laughs> thank you. We don't have uh, music for this one yet. But, oh. Okay, so this is. <laughs> <laughs> this always Rigged. happens. This is something that doesn't happen a lot. So, uh, we're Rigged. going to it. We're going to draw again. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> That's pretty funny. I, I, I saw Cuckoo in there. Like, I saw some names yeah. that I recognize of all the ones I don't people we know. Zayori is going to win next, yeah. so uh, I hope you're ready. Oh, okay, you so uh, our winner. <laughs> so I thank you so much for being here. So I recognize many who are already watching here. Uh, I recognize yeah. you, um, just to give shout out to everyone. Shanks, Kuku, Spraki, um, Ramil, thank you so much for being here. And then Shanks here, thank you so much. You won the 
can you win the YGG swag box when you are also from YGG? So I don't think so. <laughs> I think we should draw another one, Mike. Yeah, we were sorry. Um, we were just going to decide and <laughs> for this one. So yeah. All right, call the audible. Here we go. <laughs> Does Zayori get to keep the swag bag if he wins? That is the real question because I can feel it coming. Okay, Russell J. Okay, so you won by the swag box. So just inbox us and we're going to do some logistics on that part. So um so Zayori, thank you so much for um for being with us today. I'm sorry for, yeah. for a bit of one over time, but um if you have some final message to to the Filipino Axi community at, at this um right now and I'm working people thank you first absolutely uh, thank you so much for having me no worries about going over time it's probably my fault because i talk too much so uh no worries there i'll certainly take the blame always a pleasure i love being able to hop on with you guys uh, I, I love doing interviews where folks actually ask good pointed questions about what's happening in the axie space so we get to uncover some new information i couldn't be more excited about the stuff that we're building i know sometimes it feels like we're moving really slow but i want to remind everyone that scaling is hard um in the 10 months that i've been at sky mavis we've gone from 38 employees to 115. Most of them are from the Web2 centralized world, and they have so much learning to do to get caught up on Web3 and blockchain and NFT gaming. We've hired some really talented people. We just announced our director of business development, Kathleen Osgood, yesterday. She is incredible. She's a super rock star when it comes to business development and has some really big ideas for bringing other games into the Ronin network and ecosystem. Um, mm. I, I also just want to remind people that like internally, our estimate is that it, it can take up to six months for a new employee to be completely onboarded and up to stuff if they don't have much history in Web3, if they're from a truly like Web2 traditional uh, environment. It took me a good five or six months to feel 100% comfortable doing these interviews, understanding the talking points and understanding all the moving parts of the, the technology and the vision. Um, and that's like, you know, I'm a gamer. I've been in esports and I was introduced to Axie in 2018. So if it took me that long. I can only imagine what it's like for someone yeah. who's also learning about gaming, also learning about blockchain, and also trying to get caught up on Axie's robust history and then stay caught up because everything moves so fast. It feels like if you go on holiday for a week and stop reading, you miss all of this news and all these new things that came out. So I just want to throw that out there to remind people that like we're moving as fast as we can without sacrificing quality. And there are so many people coming into the Sky Mavis team that are insanely talented that um, I, I can't overstate how big their impact is going to be on this project. So uh, quiet before the storm. Origin is coming. Uh, so excited to, to see so many people here in the Facebook chat and looking forward to seeing you play Origin. Uh, you probably know where to find me. I'm Zayori TV everywhere. Make sure you follow Axie Infinity as well on Twitter. Uh, we've been doing a lot more content on the Axie channels also. So twitch.tv slash Axie Infinity, youtube.com slash Axie Infinity. Great spots to check out interviews with like community spotlights. We did a fireside chat about security not too long ago that's been uploaded there. And I would definitely encourage everyone to check out that content uh, and make sure you're, you're staying safe. Um, but I think that's it for me. Really appreciate it. And I uh, hope you guys keep up the good work as well. Thank you so much for bringing me on. Yes. Thank you so much, sir, for being here. Quick shout out to our Bitcoin Ice Hiders who are still here, Mega, Nathan, RZ, Julia, and the Empress team. So, yeah, so this is the Bitcoin Ice webcast. So, all of these discussions are for information. You know, crypto is risky, Bitcoin is risky. Um, but we are at the point of something new. But as you know, ignorance is a can wash everything that you can. So, this is the Bitcoin Ice webcast signing off. Thank you, everyone. Thank, Thank you, Sarah. Thanks, guys. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.